Support for Lab Out Loud is provided by NSTA, the National Science Teaching Association. Find out more about what NSTA has to offer at nsta.org. You're listening to Lab Out Loud, science for the classroom and beyond. And today's guest is talking to us about biological classification, especially those times where we might get it right or wrong. I, it did that part, I mean, in the, in the strict and formal sense, it doesn't really work that way, right? There's, do you have sufficient evidence and do you have sufficient support? I would say that the base of that part of the tree of life is not resolved. Right and wrong in the context of science is less important, I think, than you know, thoughtful contributions that, uh, that, that advance our thinking and push research questions. That's up next on Lab Out Loud, but first I'm your co-host Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell. You know, I'm thinking about like your little intro piece there, Dale, and you know, like what is right or wrong. But your little your little teaser like made me think about like is the, is that the right question in science? Is do we have something right or wrong? And how and how do we know? It's a tricky part because when you're teaching science, there are rights and wrongs, immutable facts. But yeah, exactly. We spend a lot of time of that as science teachers. You know, science teachers take papers home and grade them, and there is that <laughs> aspect of of that process but then there is the idea that science is a process and that it's not you know it's changing it's a human experience right yeah and there's you know we've been hearing about this i guess a lot in the media in the last couple of years and literally i think we need to kind of take a step back and think about what does it mean when a scientist proclaims something and and is it right or wrong or is that a fair question what is the process that gets us there how do we verify our results So our guest talks a little bit about like right and wrong or if that's, you know, like we said, is that a fair thing and and how do we get there? Yeah, we are on the subject of biological classifications or or what's the what's the fancy word, Brian? Well, he talks about phylogeny, but that that kind of means a little bit more about uh, the 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 relationships of organisms uh, and thinking about their, you know, like their descent and relationships among each other. And so it's a piece of classification that we would we would lean upon as, as evidence. Yes, and his research team has been spending a, a lot of time talking about that and its relationship to arachnids and the horseshoe crab. What? Arachnids and horseshoe crabs? So that's our conversation today. So let's meet our guest. My name is Prashant Sharma. I'm a member of the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Department of Integrative Biology. So my job at UW is a research professor and a teaching professor. So part of what I do is run a research lab that focuses on the biology of arthropods and specifically arachnids. And as a teacher, I teach classes in introductory biology and also in the biology of invertebrates. Specifically arachnids, you said? So my lab is, um, it has a couple of different research interests. Much of the work that we do focuses on arachnid biology. We've had a couple of projects in the past where we have looked at the biology of insects as a point of comparison. Uh, One of the most interesting projects we did last year had to do with the biology of sea spiders and how sea spiders are related to each other. So these are not formally arachnids, though they're closely related cousins. Wait, what's a sea spider? Sure. So a sea spider is one of the roughly 14 orders of this subphylum, Chilicerata. So Chilicerus includes two marine groups. That's sea spiders and horseshoe crabs. And the rest of the orders are terrestrial. And we collectively refer to those as the arachnids. So sea spiders are a group of really weird, um, exclusively marine animals. They're roughly 1,300, uh, maybe uh, 1,350 species that have been described. And some of them can be incredibly colorful. So like spiders that you see on land, they have uh, eight legs. What's bizarre about them is that they have no abdomen. So all of the organ systems you'd associate with the abdomen, the posterior region, uh, doesn't exist in the sea, in sea spiders. So they're this really bizarre group of animals where their guts and their ovaries and um, various components of their uh, major organ systems will run all the way into the legs. Oh my so God, I just looked, I just structure. Googled pictures of them. <laughs> they look like pipe cleaners that have been just wired together. Right. So wow. in the tropics, they can be incredibly colorful. In Antarctica, there's this really cool phenomenon in sea spiders called polar gigantism. So you'll see animals the size of dinner plates out there. Oh, yeah. 
Otherwise, how big are they normally? Uh, or... um, the ones that I've collected will be as small as a couple of millimeters to a centimeter. So this okay. is around the California Channel Islands, for example, or around the Gulf of Maine. So does that mean that in your research that you are you are out on cruises collecting these throughout the world? So for most of the field work that we do, we focused on tropical and desert habitats. For the Sea Spider Project, I had the chance to tag along with a couple of people and uh, uh, you know just go snorkeling or uh, diving in shallow habitats just to look for some of the tropical species. Most of the Antarctic work is done by my colleagues in uh, in different countries who are part of that team. Well, Prashant, you're, mm. from, you're from Wisconsin, so that, where Dale and I are from. So we already have a good taste of winter. You don't need to go to Antarctica to get more, right? <laughs> <laughs> good, good choice going to the tropic areas. Yeah, it was a coincidence. We saw the New York Times article and we're like, wait a minute, this is our state. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So you've you've been involved in classification then, um, and uh, let's let's back up a step here because if I think about classification, I think about teaching in in high school biology, for instance, and kind of the the basic tenets of, of classification are are kind of thinking about the Linnaean system, and then how did we organize organisms? How did we put them into different orders? How did we you know uh, how do we get them into where they are today, and then uh, we have a lot more robust information from uh, biochemical analyses and genetic lineages to to maybe rewrite some of those you know ancient classification kind of setups that way. Um, is that is that pretty much what's going on, or or how how is oh, that different? Much, very much so. No, that that's you've you've hit the nail on the head. Um, there was a moment in time when and this is in the very early two thousands when I was uh, when I was a college student where my introductory biology textbook seemed to change from year to year, or actually, no, I take that back, it was from semester to semester. And the reason for this is that this was right around the heyday of molecular phylogenetics. So people were starting to sequence genes to classify Mm -hmm. different groups of animals instead of the more traditional route of coding morphological or anatomical structures into data matrices. I still had textbooks that had like four to five to six kingdoms. And, you know, that it's kind of fascinating to see that progress. Right, right. Um, and, and the Tree of Life looks very different from the way it did, you know, just uh, just 20 years ago. Um, yeah. And so the work that we're pursuing with the arachnids is it's another one of these really tricky parts of the Tree of Life where we're still seeing the continuation of that phenomenon where molecular data are starting to overturn some of these, you know, older, often century old anatomical hypotheses. Hmm. You know, this is is kind of an aside here, but a coincidence. Yesterday I was talking to a a librarian at an elementary school and they were talking about their books in the library and that they got it, that some of them are from the nineties and they were looking at, and like, look at this book. These kids don't look the same anymore. You know, the kids laugh at what they're wearing. And I said, I'd, I'd kind of be a little bit more worried about like the, being a science teacher about the science books, like what's going on in there. <laughs> and I was right. like, Hmm, I wonder if we should, you know, is there some, uh, now I'm thinking there's some book on insects or something, uh, arachnids there. That'll be like, uh, I don't know, record scratch. Well, <laughs> you had, a, to... you said something, I think profound Dale a, a little bit ago where, mm, we, we have our curriculum that deals with weather in, in some of the elementary level, and none of it contains references to Hurricane Katrina because it's obviously before that. Oh, well, yeah. Well, we've learned a lot about weather <laughs> since then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's we were talking kind of tongue-in-cheek, but thinking about this conversation right now, maybe maybe not so much. Maybe it, it is realistic to say that there's got to be a cutoff for, for, these, um, for these references. Um, it, it seems to vary from uh, book to book and field to field. One of the gratifying things that I've seen, uh, both for arthropods, so things like you know insects and arachnids and what have you, and also for annelids, is that there are increasingly efforts to update textbooks, introductory zoology textbooks, uh, to reflect the most recent understanding of how these different groups are related. So, um, you know, in in there, there's the textbook that I used for my invertebrate zoology class. It was last updated in 2016, and it had references as recent as two months before it came out. I mean, they did a really good job of wow. uh, pulling in the recent literature. 
And the authors of that book, so this is um, what, is, what is commonly known as Brusca's Invertebrates. I mean, it's been around for quite a while. Uh, this was the one that I learned invertebrates from when I was a college student. Um, there's a new edition coming out just I think next I year. That one. Yeah, right, right. It's a very, very common invertebrates textbook. Um, new edition coming out next year, and it's going to keep on making some of those updates. Uh, similarly, Greg Rouse has put up this beautiful textbook on annelids, and he goes through the new classification system and how the, there were these old phyla that we thought were completely separate from annelids that are now in annelids. And um, it really makes people, you know, kind of try to have to stay up to speed just to keep track of what's happening sure. in these groups. Yeah. I wonder if that's how the general public should sometimes be reminded to think about science. Like, hey, uh, the additions change. We get new information. We get uh, uh, proposals or we get, you know, we get papers written and then people uh, test that and they have challenges. And there's, you know, that, that science is this you know, evolving, living, evolving, I'm using all the terms, <laughs> but it's this growing process, which results in different additions as we go. Cause I, I still think, uh, too many th- people think it's just uh, set in stone. Right. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's really just gone beyond that memorization of facts and, you know, classification systems and taxonomic names and things like that. Those, um, that, that, that way of teaching has really started to go out of style in, in large part has to do with the dissemination of digital resources and smartphones, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's sure. the need to memorize some of these old classification systems and taxonomic names is just not as relevant to students anymore. So you have a, a new discovery and you, you've put it out there. Um, and, you know, we're specifically talking, uh, the New York Times had kind of highlighted this piece, that's what caught our attention, about realigning um, horseshoe crabs within, you know, basically arachnids and, and being much more closely related than we originally thought. Um, so walk us through that. Walk us through that process. What's you know what's some of the evidence that you have to say that this is what's happening? Uh, what's some of the feedback that you get? Uh, how do you verify your results? How do you know if you're right? Sure. So knowing that you're right in phylogenetics <laughs> is, is difficult. I mean, these are, a, a phylogenetic tree is a hypothesis, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there are some parts of the tree in which we have a lot of confidence. There are others in which we, you know, we, we really have to scratch our heads and wonder, okay, how do we bring new data and new evidence to solve this kind of puzzle? So that puzzle that I'm chasing has to do with the relationships of these different arachnid groups. <laughs> now, there's something like, a, for the last maybe 100 or 150 years, the traditional understanding of calicerate evolution has gone something like this. Sea spiders branched off first. Then you have groups like horseshoe crabs, and then the extinct groups like sea scorpions. So these are, you know, the, some of the largest arthropod fossils. It could be something like two meters long. So sea scorpions, probably known as eurypterids, you'll find them in, you know, fossil deposits all around here, for example, really cool group of animals. Um, and then after that, you have a transition to some sort of scorpion-like animal, followed by the diversification of the rest of the arachnid orders. And part of the evidence for that has to do with the anatomy of a specific respiratory organ. It's called a book lung. So yeah. it, if you look at it in profile, it kind of looks like the pages of a book that are stacked together. Those are all the lamellae. And those are internalized in groups like spiders and scorpions. The significance of that organ is that it looks a lot like an internalized gill. Or huh. crabs and also extinct groups like sea scorpions have this external book gill. So the transition goes something like this. There was an external book gill in things like horseshoe crabs and sea scorpion that became internalized into a book lung in a scorpion-like animal, followed by diversification of the other orders. And students listening, if you have any kind of essay question about lungs and gills and book lungs, it's a surface area. You always want to keep surface area in there. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> um, so the tricky thing about this is that Molecular phylogenies have always had a hard time with this, you know, scenario of gradual stepwise evolution of horseshoe crabs to scorpions to the rest of the arachnids. For one thing, it always looked like there was a very rapid radiation at the base and horseshoe crabs are part of it. The other problem was molecular sequence data had a really hard time getting horseshoe crabs outside of the arachnids. But for the last 20 years or so, everybody wrote it off as some sort of artifact. They figured, well, maybe there's something weird going on with our data. 
maybe it's because some groups are evolving really quickly and that throws off our understanding of substitution processes. Fast forward to this study. There's been this ongoing controversy that we've been in, um, and it started around you know, like 2014 when we, you know, started putting out the first um, phylogenomic or genome scale data sets of coloceroid phylogeny. And we found that you can sometimes get arachnids monophyletic, but you really have to try. I mean, you have to, you know, essentially mess with your data quite a bit to get that result. And that made us wonder, are we getting the result because we're going looking for it? Or is it because it's a natural result? Mm-hmm. Um, ah. Okay. Well, one of the limitations of those studies was that we were actually missing a lot of these arachnid orders, right? Some of these really miniaturized groups, the orders that are something like two, two millimeters long as adults, we didn't have those in the tree. So in the last few years, um, after I moved to Wisconsin, I started you know, going around the world and generating better phylogenies, things like sea spiders and scorpions and finding some of these miniaturized groups. We put them into the tree. And now when you have all the arachnid orders sampled, the tree falls apart. I mean, you can't get arachnids monophyletic. Horseshoe crabs are nested inside of that of the group with you know, maximal support. And the last bit of evidence here that was missing was that anatomical and morphological understanding. So again, the century-old data set. The, what we've done here that's different from what we've done before is we finally took the time to just code a morphological matrix for more than 500 species. And we combine that with the molecular evidence. And as it turns out, that doesn't rescue the tree. You still can't get arachnids monophyletic. As it turns out, the morphological evidence for arachnids being a single group is not very strong. Um, so at this point, we just kind of blurted it out and said, okay, we think that horseshoe grass might just be arachnids. And that set off a little firestorm in the New York Times. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I'm looking at, no, I went to Wikipedia and looked at like arachnids and trying to kind of get up the picture um, of the tr- the branches here, the trees. So we have arachnidia, right? Am I saying that? Uh, yeah, arachnida, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so then that branches off into things that, I don't know, one of these things looks like a, a tick or a <laughs> bed bug or something. There's yeah, a whole bunch so... of things on the top here and then... There's a section here which has got spiders, scorpions, A M B L Y, Amblypigy, whip spiders, yeah. Okay. And yeah, then super there's, cool animals. Then there's the next thing that's T H E L Y. Yep, the thelophonids. So vinegaroons, the ones that spray acetic acid at you. Jesus. Um, and then pseudoscorpions. Or yep, scorpions? Pseudoscorpion. Yep, pseudoscorpions. Yes. Book scorpions, yeah. Book, and so then where we put where or where yeah, where, where was will. horseshoe crabs and where might horseshoe crabs or where is it being suggested? Sure. So time was when horseshoe crabs were like the sister group, so they branched off before all of the arachnids. So all these groups, mites, ticks, spiders, scorpions, mites. pseudoscorpions, etc. All of them, these terrestrial eight-legged animals, were thought to form a single group with horseshoe crabs just outside of them. Okay. Our analyses are suggesting is that they go somewhere inside of the arachnid tree. Exactly where is debatable. It depends upon the analysis that we run. But okay. generally speaking, we recover them in the group that has book lungs or that resemble animals that secondarily lost the book lungs. So things like pseudoscorpions and hooded tick spiders. In other okay. words, we're kind of inverting the tree, right? We're suggesting mm-hmm. that, well, there's not this really cool book gill to book lung transition. Rather, all the animals that have those structures are just one branch within the arachnids, and horseshoe crabs are part of that branch. All right. What about that uh, sea spider? Where do they live? Sea spiders' positions are, that position is fairly unambiguous. So they are the at the very base of the tree, if you okay. want to think of it that way. They're the first okay. branch to, to uh, sprout off. There was a controversy about those something like 20 years ago, where some people argued that they were at, they branched off uh, at the very base of the arthropods, and then the rest of the arthropod groups came afterwards. But again, molecular, molecular data started to resolve that a little bit more definitively. So now they're held to be the sister group that the rest of these Cholesterol, so things like uh, arachnids and horseshoe crabs go together with the sea spiders. So this book lung or gill or th- that discussion basically ties to whether it lives in, you know, terrestrial. It lives on land or sea, right? 
Exactly. And so we we, we kind of when we go back through these these histories here, we're, we're thinking about this um, evolution coming out of the ocean or out of the water to land. Um, is that correct? Yes, exactly. So the so if you put horseshoe crabs and their allies, things like sea scorpions, inside the arachnid tree, right? Mm-hmm. You've got a bit of a problem. Now there's no longer this nice, clean, single transition from water to land that we'd previously supposed. So how do you reconcile this with this new phylogeny? There are two possible interpretations. One of them is that starting from a sea spider-like ancestor, you have a colonization of land by the common ancestor of arachnids plus horseshoe crabs. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to the water in the horseshoe crab branch. So think of horseshoe crabs like the whales of the arachnids now. Yeah. That's right? nice. I remember uh, Brian and I talked about this on the podcast before, but the, like the first time I was in college right. when I learned that whales went back, I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, so that's one way to think of it. I tend to think that that's pretty implausible, but there's mm. some debate about, you know, exactly how much evidence there is for that idea, right? And some people would say, well, you know, at least some people on our team have argued, okay, but I mean, consider that horseshoe crabs have to come back to land to lay their eggs. The only other animals that we know do things like that are secondary marine vertebrates, right? Things like sea turtles, yeah. which also mm-hmm. went back to the water. I think that's, you know, I, I, I think that's a fair point. I just don't think it's a, it's a ton of evidence. Um, the alternative scenario is that Horseshoe crabs and their allies, so things like sea scorpions, they just never left the water. Everybody else colonized land independently. So you're looking at a multiple colonization events along the base of the arachnid tree of life. As many as, you know, four or five different terrestrialization events. Now, it seems implausible at first, right? It seems like really like a really expensive scenario or, or an unparsimonious scenario. But there are two things that make for me make that scenario fairly plausible. The first is that we have seen that scenario play out too many times in other parts of the inorbit tree of life. And examples of this include things like terrestrial decapods, uh, so land crabs, for example. That's not one colonization of land. That's at least 10 different events. Um, uh, if you've ever flipped over a rock and seen pill bugs, you know, like, like uh, mm-hmm. there's something called yeah. uh, roly polies. Yeah, roly polies. Yeah, roly uh, polies. There was a study from two years ago that showed that's not a single group either. That's two different groups that both colonize land independently. Again, we just thought based upon anatomy that they were all one group, but far from it. Oh. And, and the anatomy piece is where we kind of classified everything in originally, but a lot of those evol- those evolution features evolved because they're under the same environments, the same constraints that kind of push towards the same solutions. So we're looking exactly. at two two things, two creatures, and we're like, hey, these look same, same, so their their history must be the same, same. Exactly. But then, uh, the so more, then, how do you find out that that's not true? Sure. So one of the important things about molecular phylogenetics is that the genes that we are studying are often not associated to those selective pressures. It's not like we're analyzing the genes that are exclusively making those respiratory organs, for example, or involved in um, uh, water transport on land versus water. We're looking at genes that are involving that generally tend to be evolving, you know, more or less like uh, uh, in independent parts of the genome. In other words, the the data sets that we're working with are not biased by the possibility of anatomical convergence, Mm -hmm. right? Those genes might be doing completely different things. Maybe they're just making RNAs. Maybe they're just involved in transcription or something. Or maybe they're just involved in homeostasis. They may have nothing to do with water-to-land transitions. So they provide this independent data set that has um, uh, a disconnect from the anatomical features and that's what we're after i like to think about that as kind of like an evolutionary makerspace because you know the in a makerspace you might have like all these all these pieces that that maybe had a different purpose that are repurposed into something else like how many things could you make into a wheel for instance well in this case you're saying there's a dozen different genes that could be repurposed into something else i mean maybe Uh that's an oversimplification uh, we have seen scenarios like that in, in several, you know, fantastic case studies in Evo Devo for sure. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly if you think about, you know, terrestrial groups like Evo know, Devo, where have I heard that before? Sean uh, Carroll. Sean Carroll. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
one of the godfathers of Iwo Jima, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Madison, too. Um, uh, yes, so he retired a, a couple of years after I got here, which is <laughs> which is too uh, much regret. Um, yeah, one of my heroes. <laughs> I'm one of my absolute heroes when yeah. I was growing up. We've had him on the uh, show a few it. times, and we've met him. Five times. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. awesome. Yeah, he's a remarkable storyteller and excellent at communicator science. Yeah, if you've seen his documentaries, those are just wonderful teaching tools. Well, the yeah, like the the poc, uh, the the rock pocket mouse, the you know, like a, a nice comparison to how uh, you know environmental pressures shape evolution. That's that's not the <laughs> that's not the peppered moth example, for instance. You know, <laughs> uh, if you've seen his Galapagos finch. Uh, documentary, yep. the one where he interviews Peter and Rosemary Grant. Yes, he just does a beautiful job of explaining the biogeography of the islands and the phylogenetics and the, how we use these kinds of molecular data to infer, you know, when these islands were colonized and things like mm-hmm. that. Just absolutely wonderful documentary from yeah. the Beak of the Finch. It's another classic. There, we see we hmm. we grew up around the same time with some of this stuff in our <laughs> in our learning. Yep. So okay, so back to Brian's makerspace kind of idea. Um, different things could, it's possible that different, how did we say this again, Brian? Different genes could be purposed into a similar function. Yep. So and this so when is you, something, oh, go ahead. Oh, sure. oh, so this is, so half of my lab works on phylogenetics, right? So using molecular sequence data to understand how groups are related. And that is applied to different contexts. So understanding, for example, how caves were colonized in Israel by spiders for, as, as for, for instance, Right. Um, the other half of my lab works on the mechanisms themselves at the genetic level. So they focus more on the ego devo. So they will try to investigate how changing the expression patterns of certain genes or the timing of expression of different genes will result in different anatomies or different morphologies. So they try to understand what are the genetic underpinnings of these, you know, of, of biodiversity, essentially. So among the things that, you know, we've been able to do in the past, and this has to do with our, you know, cave blindness project, is we've been able to essentially shut off the eye patterning program of spiders. We can make spiders blind. Um, and then a work produced uh, last year, we were able to transform daddy long legs into daddy short legs, essentially. We were <laughs> able to interfere with the elongation program uh, of the appendages. And... Oh. What this research that, you know, we've, we've been talking about um, is really pushing us to chase is what are the genetic underpinnings of um, the book lungs and the book gills of these different, you know, cholesterol groups. As for um, this idea about the co-option of genes to serve different functions, one of the coolest stories here has to do with um, these genes that are involved in making appendages, and making legs. Two of these that we've worked on in the past, they're called SP69 and distal S. They're almost always involved in patterning appendages. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, appendages of insects or spiders or what have you. Switch those off and the legs go away, right? They become, you lose the distal part of the leg. Okay. My student Emily Second showed a couple of years ago that in spiders and only in spiders, these genes have an additional function. They play a role in patterning the first and second walking leg segments in other words they're using leg genes to make their heads knock down those two genes yeah they get the short legs for sure but there's an earlier function where they'll lo- lose those two segments of the head itself so you end up with a the animal that has a much shorter head and is missing two leg segments completely absolutely bizarre we wow. don't know why that's, that's really yeah that's really yeah. cool yeah. Yeah, we don't know why that happened. We don't know why that, that co-option occurred. Um, and one of the things that we've been trying to do is chase how far across the arachnids we see that happening. Um, but yeah, more, it, it's, it's one of those fun stories that, you know, we just kind of ran into when we were looking at co-option of genes. This is like biology accounting. <laughs> right, right. But it takes us a long way away from the, the classic uh, Drosophila, uh, you know, experiments of finding out, turning genes on and off and, and finding mutants there. Right. Prasant, you mentioned there was a little bit of a firestorm with this idea that, you know, reorganizing the horseshoe crab there. Um, did you <laughs> did you get pushback? Did you are you still getting pushback? I feel like I've been eating pushback since like 2014 or something like that. So <laughs> there's um, do you there's, get there's, like hate mail from 
horseshoe crab so, enthusiasts? So oddly, enough, oddly enough, the only hate mail that we've gotten has come out of our Evo Devo work. When we put out the Daddy Short Leg story. Oh, how dare us, you? <laughs> oh, somebody wrote to us and said, why are, you, why are you genetically engineering these animals? You know, you shouldn't do that. And then, you know, we didn't, we, we had to, we, we wrote them a nice email where we said, you know, these animals only live in the, in nature for 40 to 60 days. So it, it, they'll be fine. Um, <laughs> we're pretty sure they don't feel anything because they're embryos. You know, it's not like they hatch out and start walking around with short legs or anything like that. But anyway, <laughs> so the firestorm. So part of it is, um, at, at least within the community of scientists, there's definitely controversy here, right? And it's not just here. There are various parts of the tree of life that are incredibly controversial. You may have heard of this back and forth argument that's been going on for 15 years about who is the sister group of the rest of the animals, whether it's sponges or cone jelly. That's an argument that's been going on for a while. That sounds like a T-shirt ready to be made. Yeah. Yeah, Team sponge. (laughs) Yeah, I think they exist. Yeah, they absolutely exist. People get really up in arms about that stuff. Um, In the case of... The arachnids, most of the pushback we get is from paleontologists and from you know, kind of like, like the people who first started building these morphological phylogenies. Okay. Right? And like this is the way we've the, always done it. And how dare you challenge this? this? The way. <laughs> or that molecular sequence data could just be wrong, right? That okay. maybe they could just be very confidently wrong. You were asking earlier about validation. Why do we believe that there's, there's you know, any reality to any of this? What if this is all just nonsense? One of the cool things we started finding out about cholesterol is that there are certain groups that have undergone whole genome duplications. So they have multiple copies of lots of genes, right? It's an event that is systemic. So the whole genome got duplicated. So you see evidence for it all across the genome. It's really hard to mask. It's a really nice benchmark for what's going on in the, in the, across the phylogeny, right? Mm-hmm. In other words, there are groups of arachnids that have two copies of pretty much all these important pattern of genes, and there are others that have one copy, right? And you see these genes arrayed in different clusters, so you have groups of them that occur in different chromosomes. So you have this really strong evidence for are you part of the group that got the duplication, or are you not? How does this mm-hmm. impact phylogeny? As I told you before, there's a traditional and classic scenario of, well, scorpions go somewhere near the base of the tree. They yep, sit yep. somewhere between sea scorpions and the rest of the arachnid. One of the things that I that I found out, you know, during my postdoc, uh, and then this is a work that got published a couple of years ago when the first, you know, like like densely sampled and high quality genomes started coming out for arachnids, was that scorpions and spiders both share this whole genome duplication. And more recently, in a work from last year, we showed that pseudoscorpions also share this whole genome duplication to the exclusion of groups like mites ticks, daddy long legs, sea spiders, and so forth. In other words, there's a really powerful line of evidence that has nothing to do with sequence data and has nothing to do with anatomy that groups scorpions and pulls them down well and deep into the base, of, uh, uh, away from the base of the tree and deep into the tips of the arachnid tree of life. And as far as I know, the only analyses that we've been able to to run that have recovered these relationships, the ones that are supported by this genome duplication event, these rare genomic characters and these rare genomic changes are our molecular phylogenies and the combined analyses of morphology and molecules that we just published. To my knowledge, there's no morphological data set that's been able to recover a tree that is consistent with this rare genomic change. So this gives us a little bit of validation it gives us some confidence at least that at least one part of our tree is starting to make a little bit more sense you've got and what we're doing now yeah well what we're doing now is sequencing genomes of you know some of these other groups to ask okay maybe are they part of the group as well maybe there are other events that we don't know about um partial genome duplications for example or something like that if we can use these rare genomic changes as an independent line of evidence it may have more sway over people who can't agree about the difference between morphology and molecular phylogeny. So think of it as like a yeah. third type of evidence that will that is completely independent and hopefully will win over some more people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some yeah. of this sounds like the the argument right now about uh, do do fish exist? Oh yeah, <laughs> we were talking about that earlier right before we started. You know about um, that, Dale? No, but I know birds don't exist. 
<laughs> that's that's different. This is an actual like, <laughs> yeah, that's that's a whole different area there. But the idea no, I, that that fish is a construct that doesn't really work anymore. Right. So because it's, well, my again, dad's on just... on the ice right now, st- uh, sturgeon spearing. So I think he's done. Now. <laughs> <laughs> he's so, going to have a, quite a surprise. <laughs> Uh, I mean, arachnids are going to be in the same boat pretty soon, right? It won't be a, a single cohesive group. That is to say, a common ancestor and all of its descendants. It won't be like a single branch in the tree of life. It'll be multiple branches. And I mean, those names still have value, right? They're still useful to us, even if they aren't single or monophyletic, as we call them, groups. And there are lots of examples of such useful names, right? We all understand conceptually what bug, that's a good one. We all can understand conceptually what reptiles are. We all know what microbes are. Uh, We all generally understand what a protist is. So even though they don't have a formal definition in science, those terms and those concepts are still useful to us just to refer to a, you know, even if it's not a, even if it's not a single assemblage of organisms. Sure. Because otherwise, the fish fry goes out the window on Friday nights in Wisconsin. <laughs> you can say that again. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, really, I really want to become like a Telios fry. This there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, I have, I'm, in certain circles, I'm sure that's a hit. I'm sure, you know. <laughs> yep. Oh my gosh, that you should start that. <laughs> oh, the Telios fry? Yeah. We're, we're, we're keeping it accurate. Just keep it 100%. Yeah. I have a. Um, okay, so. These are sort of human, you know, you the person question. Do you think you're right? Um, like, does it work know. that way? Uh, it doesn't really work that way. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, do you have... And if your students are listening about... right now, just ignore this part here? No. Well, I mean, because certainly, like like I said, we read the New York Times story. It kind of always starts it up like, this guy has an idea, or this group has an idea, but this group got mad, you know, and... And a lot of science news goes that way. People but love it, science fights. Is it a tennis match? Yes. Is it a beef? Uh, I mean, you know. To some degree, I mean, okay. So to some degree, yes, it's been a beef, right? Um, there's this group in the UK that's put out, you know, phylogies that they've been able to recover arachnid monophyly, right? And we've pointed out explicitly in this paper that we put out, okay, but one, that paper didn't sample all the arachnid orders, right? And two, uh-huh. if you take those missing orders and you add them to their data sets, you flip the tree you break arachnid monophyly with complete support. So how much confidence can you have in it? And in, okay, is it is it that much of a beef? Um, I mean, there's some people who take this stuff really personally, right? Yeah. There's definitely that. I think the news media loves science fights, right? So sure. science reporters, everybody loves a good science fight. It's just, it's entertaining. You didn't get your popcorn out. Yeah. Um, but do we think we're right? I, it does that part. I mean, in the in the strict and formal sense, it doesn't really work that way, right? There's, do you have sufficient evidence, and do you have sufficient support? I would say that the base of that part of the tree of life is not resolved. I would say mm. that there's fairly compelling evidence that we are not looking at a monophyletic arachnid, right? Yeah. But there's nothing to say that the, that evidence couldn't show up tomorrow. Some other group might come out the next day and say, hey, look, we found this really cool, rare genomic character that unites all the arachnids. Or, hey, if you double the sampling, if you go from 500 to 1,000 species, right, or if you have better substitution models, or if you have more refined analyses, that's going to completely change your tree. You'll be able to solve all your problems. That's the silver bullet you were looking for. Uh The thing is, every silver bullet that's been proposed up until now, like sample more species, or use more genes, or use better genes, None of those have worked consistently. That's the problem. And my argument is that probably suggests to us that the only reason you sometimes see arachnids in molecular data sets might be because you go looking for them. And that's mm-hmm. a problem. Because if you're looking for things, if you're looking for results in trees that make you happy, you can justify whatever you want. This is something that we did as a proof of concept a couple of years ago. Um, we, we, so in, in a paper published in 2019, we, there was this running jo- gag in the lab called making horseshoe crabs crabs again so what we did here was just as a joke we um <laughs> sorry we looked, <laughs> just processing yeah, that yep 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 we, we looked for genes where we could actually put horseshoe crabs back with crustaceans they're not crustaceans at all by the way right but we said okay what if they were like let's just pretend that we were looking for genes that could recover this result could we get it and the answer was oh yeah we can get it with maximal support wait i didn't so, know they're not crustaceans you just kind of no, blew right past that so uh, so 
crustaceans will are distinguished from horseshoe crabs by having antennae, right? These are two pairs of antennae. And horseshoe crabs uh, will lack antennae completely. They'll have instead the chelicera, right? So it's like a, it looks like a little pincher. And this is what unites them with the chelicerets. So things like sea spiders and arachnids. Okay. Yeah. okay. But anyway, um, so that's why I worry about going and looking for support for a specific hypothesis, right? Um, I worry that in the age of massive data sets, you also have the age of noise and the potential for biasing your result, for tricking yourself into believing that a result is true when it's actually not. And and finding the evidence for it, but ignoring other larger you know pieces. That was right. a similar question I was going to have. Is oh yeah, this is an honest moment here now? Do you want to be right? <laughs> like, um, are you right versus do you? I mean, you got a lot invested in this, right? So deep down, well, before you go I to bed. <laughs> I mean, do I, I, mean, I would say that I don't know. So the thing with phylogeny is just that they're again they're just ideas, right? They're yeah. just ideas. And I would be just as prepared to be completely wrong about this. First paper that I ever produced, um, the, the first paper that I ever wrote as an undergraduate, it made a particular comment about which eyes were, you know, the evolutionary descendants of which types of eyes in daddy long legs. A few years later, you know, as a postdoc, we ran a fossil which completely falsified that idea. We found a four-eyed harvestman fossil, a four-eyed daddy long legs fossil. And show mm-hmm. that, well, no, there's two different sets of eyes across the harvest bin. And my first paper, completely wrong. Mm-hmm. So that's just how science goes, right? I mean, yeah. Just, you know you've made it when you've disproven yourself. Yeah. So that For me, that happened really quickly, which is probably not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it is, though. It's prepared you for it. I'm wondering if, like, high school students, you know, do they... I think about my own students where... They, we've had times where we we've set up... Like, how do you think this discrepant event is going to go? And then we test it. And I remember students kind of going to their camps and cheering when they got the results, you know, and, and not and, and that kind of stuff. So how do you get to that place as a scientist to be ready for the evidence instead of ready for the evidence you are rooting for? Does that make sense? Can I, I, I totally hear you, but you cannot. Yeah, you can. You have to get yourself to a point where you're just disconnect yourself from the evidence completely right and you can't have a personal stake in what the outcome is going to be so would it be nice that we if we were right maybe uh would it be nice if we were wrong well that would definitely simplify a lot of things right we wouldn't have to spend as much time chasing the question if we just answered it we can move on to other questions yeah and that's that's kind of the goal um put it this way one of the one of my heroes in science was um was a zoologist named Sidney Manton. So she was mostly active through the middle of the 20th century. So she was a British zoologist. She worked on the uh, biology of arthropods and then another group called velvet worms. So these are these animals that spray slime. They're really cool. Um, and Great punk they're band not, name. Yeah, they're not actually worms. They, I mean, they they look like really squishy uh, arthropods that don't have sec- that don't have external like you know segments and uh, well anyway. Sidney Manton was an absolutely fantastic biologist. Everybody thought she was crazy. And the reason that she, everybody thought she was crazy was because she argued that maybe arthropods weren't monophyletic. She put velvet worms inside of the arthropods and, you, and she wanted them, she believed that they were united with, you know, things like insects and millipedes and centipedes and stuff like that. Hmm. Yeah, and they this was they certainly on, don't look like it. I'm right. looking at them right and, now. And this was in large part based upon anatomical embryological evidence. She was a fantastic embryologist. Sidney Manton was wrong about arthropod monophyly, but it doesn't matter. She's still going down as one of the best zoologists uh, mm. in history. The reason is she made us think about why we believed what we believe. She made us think about what is an arthropod and how do you know that this group goes together? What's the evidence for it? So – right and wrong in the context of science is less important, I think, than you know, thoughtful contributions that uh, that, advi- that advance our thinking and push research questions. Yeah. 
I, I'm reading, I just finished a book called Super Heavy, and it's make, it's basically the, the making of the elements past uranium. And, uh, it, and it's a fascinating, it, there's like a cold war of discovery between the United States and, and other countries, particularly with you know, uh, Russian scientists and, and other areas around the world. And, and they talk about a lot of uh, deception and, uh, you know, uh, again, being wrong that but that led to discoveries down the line. And so it, 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 it yes, you can get um, discovery, you can get a push for scientific endeavors by being wrong. Right. If, uh, if, yeah, if we just achieve uh, I don't know, at least the goal of a lot more people being interested in investigating arachnids or just being aware of their intricacies and their difficulties of studying them, then I think that's kind of the goal. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that's really what we're after. That's that's the thing we're really rooting for, is that people get excited about arachnids. What yeah. are some of the, you know, if we go aside from classification and study arachnids, what are some of the surprises um, and, you know, things that we're learning about them because of this work. Sure. So among the interesting things that have come out of this, um, one of the things that we've really focused on the last few years is heavily sampling the diversity of scorpions. And for a long time, everybody understood, or, or, or the traditional understanding was that scorpions are this living fossil group, right? They're living fossils. They must all be ancient. And that's just how it is. And that has to do with uh, how little they evolve across the fossil record compared to present day. But one of the things that we've been able to do with these dense phylogenies is get a sense of what's happening inside of the scorpion. So in those cases of the scorpion specifically, what we were doing was sampling the venom gland tissue. And we were sequencing the transcripts, the mRNAs basically, of the venom glands. So we managed to get a 100 species data set of either genomes or venom gland transcriptomes. Think of it as a profile across the scorpion tree of life of what venoms are being expressed in these different groups of scorpions. What we found is that one family out of the roughly 20 of scorpions that's alive today, they're called the boothids. It's asymmetrically large. Almost half of the species of, of scorpions that have been described are boothids. And it contains almost all the species that are toxic to humans, right? So the ones that are medically significant. It turns out that the scorpions that have um, venoms that will, that are specific to mammal targets, so things that will target, for example, mammal ion channels, those groups of scorpions originated around the same time that major mammal orders that predate scorpions were diversifying. In other words, it's not this you know ancient group that's been around forever. This group of scorpions is fairly young, the boothids. They're mm. about Cretaceous in age, and it seems like the origin or that sort of the selective pressure to convert insect specific toxins into mammal targeting toxins may have been driven by the sudden emergence and diversification of mammal groups that are eating the scorpions. So you can think of it kind of like the beginning of an arms race. Co-evolution yeah. piece there. Yeah. So that, that's one of the papers that we've got in review right now. And uh, that was one of the oh, really cool. fun insights that we got out of uh, really densely sampling arachnid phylogenies. Wow. That sure. is really cool. Oh, I have another question sort of related to the right and wrong thing. Sure. You um, you publish your work and then you get um, like a, a critical publication. Does that come out of nowhere or do you see it coming? Is it su- a surprise like one day? Like somebody like critiques your work or something like that? Yeah. Uh, it can be a surprise, yeah. Um, sometimes, you know, we'll get a criticism of your work that you're asked to review. Okay. And you're you're asked, you know, can you provide a comment on this, um, like a rebuttal, basically. Sure. So that'll happen. Uh, but most of the time, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's kind of been fifty fifty for me. So okay. I was just curious just how that go, how that goes down. You just get to work one day and one thirty, and did you see this? <laughs> yeah, no, and, that's happened to me. That's happened to me for sure. Ah. Um, how careful are you when you're going through it to, to, I guess, look at, say, like, okay, we have to dispel any any opening that, that someone might kind of, kind of like, you know, get attack and, yeah. and find weaknesses? Well, so when you're, when you're attacking an idea that's a century old, right, you're gonna, you know you're going to upset a lot of people. Again, I, I, so again, the language isn't really right here, right? It's not that we're attacking the idea. It's that yeah. we're testing it. And it's just that we're not finding something that the majority of 
the population on the planet believes. So you bet, you know, you better believe we're going to catch all kinds of flack for this. And so when you're testing an idea and it, and it looks like it's going to go in the direction of refuting a traditional understanding, you have to be incredibly careful, right? You have to be incredibly careful about it. One of the first criticisms that we received from, you know, like the, from a rival team was, well, it just looks like you didn't sample enough species, right? They had something like 50 species. They had something like, you know, 95 and we'd done way more analyses. We'd done like 106 different analyses, looking at all these different factors. And their trump card was, well, we just have more species, and that's the solution. Right? You just get more, and that's going to solve the problem. We, now, if you're def- in that case, it seemed like you know that group managed to get away with quite a bit, right? In the sense that um, they had something like you know like like six or seven analyses. One of them got erected monophyly. The others didn't. But they concluded that, well, therefore, arachnids must be monophyletic. And here's how you get to it. Here's the, you, you just have to follow this path, and that's how you get this traditional result. And there you go. We've reconciled this debate. Problem solved. Huh. And for us, that gets us curious, right? So we say, oh, okay, maybe we must have done something wrong. Good news. Somebody solved the problem. Okay. Now we can move on, and now we can use those genes that they use, and we can start anal- analyzing all kinds of different groups with these better genes, right? Better in quotation marks, whatever that means. So we got really excited when we saw that somebody had, may, had maybe you know solved this problem. And then when we actually looked through their data and we started looking through their analyses, it occurred to us that, well, actually, no, there's not a whole lot here. This isn't the solution we were looking for. And that's what started off this round of, okay, well, let's – See if species sampling is a solution. Let's amp it up. Let's make sure we get every order in here. Um, so the, that's a long answer to the question of how careful do you have to be. I mean, the answer is as careful as you can be, right? as careful sure. as, uh, as 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 possible. Yeah, sure. I mean, nobody wants to be wrong, right? I mean, and yeah. if you are, uh, you know, you want it to be for a good reason, right? Right. We had recently talked to the um, the discovery team about. Car- condor parthenogenesis and they they talked about you know besides covid they sat on this for a long time making sure that they knew that this was the case and uh and and again some of it they they knew this was going to be a a novel um kind of like an, a groundbreaking kind of (laughs) release there and they wanted to make sure that they had i guess dotted their i's and crossed their t's right absolutely yeah that's that's the hope right you want to you want to be as confident as you can be because um, once it's published, there's no taking it back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One, one thing we um, always like to do when we talk to a scientist is ask how you got to this path. Um, were you a kid that studied spiders all the time or was it a, sometimes it's a very linear path, sometimes a very winding path. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Oh, sure. Well, so mine was somewhere in between. Um, so I was definitely that kid that flipped over rocks all the time to look for, you know, pill bugs and crickets and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had always thought that I was going to go off to medical school. And um, I went as far as, you know, like like applying to medical school and taking MCATs and all that stuff. Like I actually managed to get pretty far along that path. Mm-hmm. The thing is, in the freshman year of college, I really just want to get involved in research. Um, and I found a job as an imaging technician uh, through a work study program. So I was trying to make money for tuition basically. Yeah. And the person I ended up working with, she's now a professor uh, at McAllister college, her name's Sarah Boyer. Uh, she was a graduate student at the time and she basically needed to take uh, SEM. So scanning electron mm-hmm. micrographs of these new species that she was describing from New Zealand. They were daddy long. Well, they were really short legged, you know, borrow kind of borrowing daddy long legs. That's where right? it started. That's how you, that's why you change those daddy long legs later in life. Yes, right? exactly. So her, her, her interest was, okay, what's happening with all these, um, uh, different species, right? How do you tell them apart? How many species are there? And, you know, she was sequencing some of them to try to understand how they're getting from one place to another. And I fell in love with the work. I really did. And the questions that I was asking in you know, this basement in front of this microscope was, okay, um, how do you actually get from one anatomy to another? How do you actually transform some genes or what have you to change the shape of this structure into something else? And one of the cool things about this group of animals, about daddy long legs, is that some tropical species have this really cool armor. So the males will be really heavily spined and they'll have pretty colors. 
and they use them to fight each other. Um, the males will kind of kick each other. This is one particular family from uh, mostly uh, found in Brazil that's just absolutely stunning to look at. Hmm. And again, I, I really want to know, like, okay, how do you make those structures and how do you change them from one species to another? Why does the number of spines and hooks you know, vary so much across the family? And no resources exist to, existed to answer any of those questions, right? At the time, you know, really nobody was pushing uh, like genetics or development of this group of animals. It, had, it was something that had been studied since the 1960s. But the tools were just being discovered at that time too. So you had this opportunity, you had this, m- m- you know, multiple opportunities right there. Right, right. So in many ways, it was about being in the right place at the right time and having great mentors. Uh, so that was how I got into it. And I just started chasing those uh, questions. That, and that's what I've been doing ever since. What about like middle school, high school? Were you a big science student then? Um, I was a total science junkie starting in, uh, yeah, starting in middle school. Yeah, mm-hmm. I really fell in love with this stuff. Um, again, always from the perspective of, you know, some sort of future in medicine. That was kind of where I saw myself. Mm-hmm. And sure. part of that also has to do with, you know, like th- some of the expectations of family members. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people equate career in science with you going to med school or you going to vet school or something to that effect. Right. But you can yeah. still say, I still am a doctor, mom. <laughs> yeah, to which she will reply, right, but I'm not calling you in case of a real emergency. <laughs> Uh, what if you, you have a spider have a lot of emergency? Spider emergencies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, if she ever needs that that spider identified, I'll be there to help. That's right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Prashant. This has been a, a fascinating conversation. I really like the the spin of how science works, and uh, I'm hoping that students and, and teachers are listening to this to think about that, and and I guess hoping hoping that that makes a difference in the public at large about <laughs> realizing how science works. Well, thank you so much for what you guys do, and thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Lab Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about some of the things discussed in this episode or previous episodes, you can find show notes at our website, laboutloud.com. If you have a guest idea or a future topic that you'd like to see on Lab Out Loud, go to our contact page and send us a message. Also, you can subscribe to Lab Out Loud on your favorite podcasting app, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to find podcasts. While you're there, leave us a review and rating. Your input helps others find our show. Thanks again for listening.